with everything he's paid for you to be here tonight in the church. Because no one can be drawn to, to the church or to Jesus without the Holy Spirit drawing them. And because you're here tonight, I know the, a fact that God has a purpose for you being here. So give him your full attention and let everything that God wants to give to you tonight, just open up your heart and let him in. Friends, will you welcome with me Abner Suarez. Hey, thank you. You could be seated. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be among a family. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's see. It's probably been seven years ago. A lady who was involved in our intercession. I don't know if I've told this story, but I'll just tell it again. This prophecy is supposed to come to pass. It's not just supposed to stay in your journal. Um, and if it's not fulfilled completely in you, it should be fulfilled in the next generation. Because every, every anyway, um, like seven years ago, I was, uh, I was at a conference, and this lady who was working with our intercession in the ministry at the time, she gave me this word, and this word was, the Lord says that you're going to go to all 50 states, and I'd never told anyone, I asked the Lord to bring me to all 50 states, and then, he, then she said, but you're not just going to come in as a guest speaker, you're going to go places, and you're going to be welcomed as part of their family. Isn't that amazing? It's, it happens. It happens all over the world. Like, they're like, we feel like you're part of our family. I said, thank you. <laughs> and it's a reminder of God's faithfulness to my life. So uh, real quick, we have a resource table. You should buy everything over there. <laughs> Not really. If you don't, if you don't want to grow, don't buy anything. <laughs> but um, if you do want to grow, you should check out that product table. That's me joking, sort of. Not really. Um, power of dreaming. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. You were born to dream, and there was a distinct, uh, there was a very distinct purpose for God putting you here on the earth, and he likes your, this is kind of giving me a little feedback. I don't know if you can work on that. Um, there was a distinct purpose that God had for you, and he liked your personality. He liked the skin color he would make you, but everything was supposed to look like God through you on the earth. There's something inside of every person because they're made in the image of God that burns with significance because the earth was supposed to be your canvas. So that's there. And then uh, prophetic clinic. If um, you're wondering about how to hear the voice of God, uh, there's a whole session. Go through all the different ways God speaks. Most people hear three, uh, three different ways. They hear, they see, and they feel. And you're not led by your feelings, but if you're thinking correctly, you'll feel the right things. So, and then also, uh, a lot of people don't really, um, it's really good to know the biblical foundation for why God does certain things. And uh, so we do, the, actually the whole first uh, session is all on the biblical foundation for uh, prophetic ministry. And then... Uh, Call this Faith 101, a lifestyle of faith. How many know that you got into the kingdom not on your own merit? Amen. amen. <laughs> you should all say amen to that or else we're all in real trouble. Yeah, exactly right. Man, I, like if I was to walk away from God today, I would probably die and I'm not joking. It's the mercy and the grace of God that sustains us to do everything we need to do here. And so you didn't earn your salvation, and you came into the kingdom by faith. You can't even come into the kingdom without God's help. And he gives you a measure of faith to receive everything that you need here on the earth. Your provision, your ministry, the favor you need for right relationships. But you didn't come into the kingdom on your own merit. And you don't need to earn any of those things either. You just need to receive it by faith. Amen. And a lot of people have been robbed from living a life. They came in by faith and they're trying to do things on their own strength. And they don't realize also the gift that brought them in is the gift that enables them to receive everything they need. Amen. The kingdom of God is not a need-based kingdom. Amen. 
or else God would have fixed all the world's problems already. There's a phrase, I probably mention it again. There's a phrase that's fascinated me for the last year, and it's this. And there was a multitude around Jesus. But there was only certain people getting what they needed from him. Uh, there's something in the atmosphere about this. But you can be around Jesus and still not receive what you need. And you can be under the grace of what he has to offer. But if you don't touch him correctly or your posture of your heart is correct, you can watch him do stuff and think it's for other people. That's there. And then, um, I haven't got my book, What God Does in an Individual, He Wants to Do in a Nation. And we, we are certainly not without challenges, but this is one of the greatest times to be alive. We would never tell anyone, hey, welcome to the kingdom, keep your depression, keep your sickness, keep your disease, keep your cancer. I hope you wouldn't tell anyone that. You know, it's just the will of God. Just, you're going to heaven, so right. just suffer, you know, leg it out, you know. I, grew, I, I, I uh, spend a lot of time as a young kid growing up being an athlete. You know, they just, just tough it out. Like, and a lot of people are toughing out their Christian experience. And so what, but we've fallen short of believing that the gospel actually can affect nations. I don't think I'm better than anyone, but I do serve the king of the universe who knows everything and who can make the world a whole lot better. You actually, your life is actually, actually supposed to answer questions people are asking. And también tenemos el libro en español ahora. If you understand that, we also have the book in Spanish. Will you stand with me? Buy everything back there. Hey, if you buy these three tonight, at least for tonight, buy all three, uh, I don't know what all of them together, but 30% off, but you got to buy them all three together. All right, because I like deals. I'm going to read this here, Proverbs 18, or not Proverbs, Matthew 18. I don't know why I said Proverbs. Proverbs 18, 19, I'm going to read this because I want to do something together. Why are you laughing? Uh, Matthew 8, 18. <laughs> I'm in Maryland tonight. <laughs> I, I do. I, sometimes I forget where I'm at. I'm in Maryland tonight. Glen Burnie, Maryland at Redemption House Life Center. Proverbs 18. <laughs> Why do I keep saying? Maybe I need to read that later. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that you ask, concerning anything that you ask, keep in mind, that when God speaks in Scripture, He's not making a suggestion. If you believe it, it will be done. We tolerate unbelief so much. But this is what it says. It will be done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three or more are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. The reason I said that is because I believe, and I know Pastor Dave has emphasized this, I believe that we're here for a strategic purpose. I believe these one, two, three, three days that we're gathered, that God has brought us here not to have a meeting, but to have an elevation in our purpose and our destiny, to have an encounter with God, to have healing, to have miracles. So I want you to just grab the hand of the person next to you because it's going to be done right now. And just begin to lift your voice and just agree that everything that you have, every, every reason you've come to this meeting is going to be fulfilled. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and we agree as one body. Father, you, you set the church in order. You set it in divine order as your, your instrument in the earth. So there's more than two and we agree. We agree for all the healings to take place. We agree for all the encounters to take place. We release in the name of Jesus the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus. We ask that you open scripture tonight. 
We ask that everything we have need of would be fulfilled. Every purpose, every reason that you brought every person here tonight within the sound of your voice, we say it will be done in Jesus' name. It will be done. 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 Everything you brought us here to do would be fulfilled. We're on a, 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 a kingdom assignment, and we receive it by your grace in Jesus' name. Now, I'll just, just lift your hands. Ooh, there it is. Whoa. I'm telling you, Jesus is here. I saw him earlier. I, I'm not even joking. He's here. Someone, you have a, a pain in your neck. It's like a shooting pain. Often happens like in the afternoon and when it rains, I don't know why, but you're being healed right now. Be healed in Jesus' name. Somebody, you have a pain in your right knee, be healed now in Jesus' name. You're being healed now. Somebody, you have a pain in the bottom of your foot, the fire of God, receive healing in the bottom of your foot in Jesus' name. Like a, like a digestive thing, the fire of God is on your digestive system in the name of Jesus, be healed in your digestive system now. Right shoulder, you have like a shooting pain. It comes and it goes, but sometimes you lift up. You, even when you worship, you try and lift your hands. Now, be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. I just saw this like, thank you, Lord. There's, um, I just saw in the spirit like, a wave, like a huge tsunami wave, and I saw right in the middle, it said miracles, and then I saw an angelic being, and there's a, a release of creative miracles to Redemption House beginning this night, and the Lord says you're going to see miracles that you have not known from this day forward. And there is an expansion coming, an expansion coming. The Lord says, I'm releasing, and I saw words and keys, and the Lord says, this is a key to enter into your next season. The Lord says, I'm releasing prophetic understanding to shift your mind to take you into your next season even today. And the Lord says, I'm going to bring expansion from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Three hundred. Four hundred. Four fifty. Four seventy-five. Five hundred. Five fifty. Five seventy-five. Six hundred. And there's a, gr there's a grace to bring, thank you, Lord. The Lord is bringing in the Asians in this season. I believe it's twofold. The Asians and the Hispanics are coming in, but there's also a connection in an Asian country that the Lord is going to give you. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's sore throat be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. There's a release from the front of the room to the back of this room of the fire of God. Just put your faith in that. One, two, three. Now! In Jesus' name, be healed. Every sickness and every disease, be healed in Jesus' name. Lower back. You've had a pain in your lower back. Discs are out of place. The Lord is beginning to put those into alignment now in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, receive that. Receive that. 
Tell your pain what Jesus is doing, not your pain what... Thank you, Lord. Thank you for miracles all across this room. Thank you for the angel, Lord, that's here. Now, Father, I need your help. Put your words in my mouth. Without you, I can't do anything. But with you, I can do all things. Father, I just declare like John, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from above. So thank you for giving me everything I need. Thank you for filling me with the Holy Spirit. Thank you for, just put your hands on your ears. Thank you for people who will call forth what is needed. Thank you to us that's been granted to know the secrets of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And as the Apostle Paul said, a wisdom hidden but now being revealed in this age. Let, the, let it be like the two disciples who walked with you even as you were resurrected. Did you open the word to them? Open up the word to us. Let your name be glorified. Que el nombre de Jesús se glorificado en este lugar. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know why I've been praying in Spanish lately. Uh, tonight, I felt like um, I'm going to start something tonight and probably finish it tomorrow. At least tonight, I think I'm doing that. But there's like hours in between, so sometimes I think I'm going to do this, but at least for tonight, I'm going to start part one, and um, it's really interesting, uh, you have like two different themes going on for this conference, and that's prophetic and identity, and I think that's, that's, that's actually a good concept, because some people might think they're not connected, but everything in the kingdom of God is synergistic, and it's co- connected one, one to another. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? But faith can only work through love. So what is it? Synergistic concept. You can, you can have authentic signs and wonders, but go to hell. Yet Jesus told the Pharisees, if they didn't believe him, they could believe the works he did. So you have these interconnected concepts and for a number of years right uh, now, I've been somewhat, maybe not concerned, but I'm concerned when anything is looked at one-dimensionally. If you look at things uh, through one dimension of the revelation that God gives us in Scripture, you will look at it in a distorted way. Okay. All right. You can't understand the epistles of Paul because the epistles of Paul, w- without understanding at least some of what's in the old, because Paul builds on what is in the old. He increases the revelation. That's also a key part. We're, we're called to live out, um, I'll, I'll talk about that later. But So I look at the prophetic as much more than just a gift. It's actually a lifestyle that's connected with your identity. I got one amen, but it's still true. So I wanted to find the term prophetic lifestyle, and then I want to look at uh, uh, the life of Joseph that gives us some real insight into what I believe this lifestyle looks, looks at from, from God's point of view. The prophetic lifestyle is this. It's the call of God upon every believer to discern the will of God for their lives and to partner with the, Holy, the, the, uh, partner with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to live out that reality. Lifestyle is this, a typical way of living, reflecting attitudes and preferences of an individual group. I love that if you'll notice, I encourage you to notice this, as Jesus interacted with people in the Gospels, as he interacted with his disciples, he he may have been releasing healing. He may have been bringing understanding. He may have been releasing compassion, but he was always trying to teach them about a way of living. That was his whole purpose for coming. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And by the way, I'm representing what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And he was constantly emphasizing and bringing them to, uh, I always encourage people, in your interactions with the Lord, watch what is being released from his hand, but also watch what he's trying to teach you out of that experience. 
The one who embraces the prophetic lifestyle is by the grace of God embracing the lordship of Jesus Christ in their mind, their will, and emotions. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus is very beautiful. He's very fascinating. You were born to be fascinated with him. If you're bored following God, you may be following a God made in your own image. They seek to be the eyes and ears of Jesus upon the earth by seeing the reality, for, by seeing reality from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit's perspective. You have the privilege of seeing everything from God's perspective. And it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Anytime I, you, you know, in, in a sense go, hey, God, what are you thinking about this? Or how does this look like from your perspective? He's never told me like, oh, it's going to be really bad. <laughs> or any even mistake I've made. I was like, man, I made a mistake there. He's never gone, well, it's over. He's never been helpless. He's never told me you're going broke. He's never told me it's not going to work. He's never told me I've left you. They seek to be the eyes of Jesus upon the earth by, by seeing reality from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit's perspective. Unless one is born again, he what? He cannot see the kingdom of God. How is the kingdom of God seen? Through a changed way of thinking, through a conversion of your mind and your heart. This releases them to uh, a grace to operate according to God's kingdom rather than the Babylonian system. That's really important because a lot of believers are converted spiritually but never learn how to live from a different system. They switch identities but they fail to switch systems. There was a void in the earth when Adam fell. It, think about it. Go back to the original design of God. It's important to always know the original design because it's how God originally intended to relate to humanity. In the garden... We can have a little interaction here. Do you think Adam was worried about what he was going to eat? No. <laughs> Good. You got that one. Did he worry about how he was going to pay his rent? No. Was he ever depressed? No. Jesus restored what was lost there, but he also elevated us to a higher place. Yeah. Yeah. I always say only God can improve upon perfection. So man, under God's dominion, did not have to worry about any of those things. As soon as he came out from the dominion of God and believed the lie, there was a void and the DNA in the earth was corrupted. And now man was trying to make his own way in the world. So what is it? Don't think 666 and all that. Think this. The Babylonian, at least how I'll define it for this. The Babylonian system is simply this. is man's way of trying to make it in the earth without God. And that's not who God has intended you to be. At the heart of the prophetic lifestyle, which is the desire of God for every believer, is to display the wisdom and glory of God in every part of their life. The prophetic lifestyle embraces dreams, visions, and prophecy as essential to God's plan for the individual. The individual who embraces a prophetic lifestyle re realizes that the fulfillment of their individual destiny is part of a much larger narrative that God desires in the earth. It's really true. It is not all about you. There is a corporate plan being played out in the earth. And he has this thing called the church. And he doesn't have any other plan. <laughs> And so he's trying to unlock your individual destiny because your individual destiny is supposed to converge with someone over there and their individual destiny as they converge with your individual destiny is supposed to make the world a better place. Amen. While the prophetic gift and its various expressions are essential part of the prophetic lifestyle, those who embrace a prophetic lifestyle view their relationship with God as a journey. I love that we're here tonight and we're here by strategic purpose, but we're, we're going to be together forever. And tonight, 
whatever God is releasing, and well, there's angels here, just all, and whatever he's releasing, whatever he's ordained to release here tonight, he might start something tonight, but a thousand years from now, we'll be talking, hey, remember July 31st, God, is it July 31st, 30th, excuse me, some, uh, 30th, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we, do you remember that night when God began to stir this up in our hearts? He began to reveal that reality, and we thought we knew something that night, but we've gone further down the road in that thing. It's an eternal church. You're not just going to be eating bonbons up there in heaven. The journey is used by God to form deep within us the very character and nature of God. Often, and I'm very, I'm very goal-oriented, I'm a very type A person, and I used to always be looking, and even as a, a, any prophetic person, you're always kind of, oh, what's the next, what's the next, and then I realized he loves the journey. As much as he loves speaking and as much, and, and the journey, if you, if you do the journey right, you get to the end goal way beyond what you thought it would be, but it's definitely not linear, and it's definitely usually not intellectual. God goes, hey, Abner, we're going over there. Okay, here we go. And he goes, no, I need you to go over there. I need you to go over there. I need you to go over there. And then you're going to work for that guy over there. Yes. In the prophetic journey, difficulty and challenges are tools to lean in the nature of God and by experience learn to overcome them through the warrior nature God has placed upon the inside of you. I used to be a big wimp, still kind of am, but I used to get very nervous when things didn't happen like I wanted them to. Now I've, I remember years ago the Lord really helped me with this. He goes, you know, problems and difficulties are just an opportunity to reveal my kindness and my goodness. He said goodness. You cannot control everything that happens to you, but you can learn how to control your reaction to it. Yes, you and you get to practice the fruits of the Spirit. Yes. See, some people in this room, you're destined for God to put millions of dollars in your hand. And right now, you got about a hundred bucks to your hand. And you're wondering, how is that ever going to happen? And it is because... It starts in here. Everything in the kingdom starts in here before it ever manifests out there. Because he wants to make sure that you'll give the 50 bucks tonight and not worry about how you're gonna, your bills are going to be paid because he wants to actually entrust you and not be caught by the system of this world, the mammon system. He wants you to realize that you're not a God unto yourself, that only you can provide for your own needs. So then when it comes to give a million, two million, no problem. This world doesn't have any pull on me. Amen. I don't know why I said that, but there's a lot of things I don't know why I say. <laughs> when we embrace the journey correctly, we're allowing the character and nature of God to build our spiritual root system properly. Embracing the prophetic lifestyle, therefore, is what helps define us and shape us and mold us as God intends. Remember years ago, the Lord spoke to me. He said, he said uh, I didn't bring you into the wilderness to kill you, but to teach you how to be an oasis in every season. In this season, the Father is inviting the people of God and releasing corresponding grace for us to become the prophetic people he intends. Great victory and breakthrough are the inheritance of the church and individuals, believers, as we embrace God's purposes in this season. I want to look at um, uh, the life of Joseph in a minute, but I want to look at, uh, I want to just declare some core values. Here's number one. God is committed to building his church. Why do I say that? Because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are 100% committed to every person in this room. If you're in Christ. 
make that qualifier. If you're in Christ and, and you've surrendered your life to Him, them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they've taken 100% commitment to you. And they know everything. And they'll help you with everything. They'll help you with every mistake you made. They're not intimidated by mistakes because they signed up to help you through every mistake. And here's the thing, though. This is very good and sobering to keep in mind. When we stand before Jesus to be judged on that day, and you should always keep that in mind, and you're not going to be judged by what you did. You're going to be judged by what they asked you to do. That means you can prophesy to my God in the world. Can go, get your book. But if God called you to be an accountant, I mean, you can do miracles and prophets. I mean, that's for everyone. But I'm saying, main thing. If he called you to be an accountant, he's going to judge you not for what you did, but what he asked you to do. But here's another very encouraging thing. When we stand before Jesus too, we can't tell him, you didn't tell me. I mean, it's kind of funny, but like, you're like Jesus, he, okay, yeah, my bad. <laughs> it's not going to work that way. Yeah, he's going to go, yeah, 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 I did. I brought that guy, Bill Vanderbush, to your church like three times in one year. You're like, oh, yeah, I know, we had baseball that night. I know. But I brought him through town, and then, um, then I started telling your wife to tell you how you were supposed to adjust, and you got mad at her because you never got healed of that father thing. And it caused problems, so she just stopped bringing it up to keep peace in the marriage. And then I gave you that prophetic word through the woman in church you didn't like, And then you turned on Christian TV one day and you judged the guy who I was trying to speak to you through about again. Then you left the church, went to another church because you said God moved you, but you just got mad. And I kept trying to tell you, it's not that I didn't love you, I just kept trying to tell you, you just didn't want to listen. And it's not that God ever throws anyone away, but often he's got to deal with you down here when he's like, like to deal with you up here in an elevated status. He didn't throw the nation of Israel away. He just had to assent to their immaturity of the way they wanted to relate to him. John 14, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Here's another thing. In the kingdom of God, we have access to all things. It's a beautiful thing. You're not lacking anything. No. Let me just say this too. Because I know there's, I'm just going to say, it. there's a spirit in this nation right now that wants to make victims out of people. Yeah. Let me just say this. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. If you got the favor and the blessing of God on your life, no man, no woman, no government, no police department can keep you back. Amen. You're like, well, my boss doesn't like me. Well, God will just take him out of the way. Or he'll bring you somewhere else. He's way bigger. He's way, way bigger than your environment and the, your surroundings. And don't let anyone make you a victim if you're in the kingdom of God. That's what overcomes everything, that you live from a different system. Either the kingdom of God and the Bible is true, or it's not. 
I choose to believe it's true. That's not to be discompassionate to anyone, but there, I, I'm serious. It, not just in this nation, but there, there, there is a spirit that tries to keep people in their victimness. I'm going to keep moving on. It's got very quiet. Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You have elevated status in the kingdom of God. Romans 8, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not also freely give us all things? Not some things, everything you need. It's really, really important because our approach to God defines the boundaries by often which we're, we're able to receive from him. A number of months ago, I was talking to the Lord about this concept of kingdom finances, and he said to me, he said, he said, most people in the body of Christ, I could not double their income this year because they wouldn't receive it. I'm getting, okay, I'm just going to, I got very quiet there. But <laughs> Let's look at Joseph, our case study. If you want to follow along, Genesis, the 37th chapter. Genesis 37. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than his all, all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. <laughs> I don't think I would have told him, but that's... Abner commentary to the story. They were binding their sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said, shall you indeed reign over us? Notice what's fascinating about it, this. His brothers knew the interpretation, and so did Joseph. <laughs> they didn't go to the dream interpretation book on this one. Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed down to him. So he told it to his fathers and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you, what, that you, have, what, that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come down to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept this matter in mind. First few characteristics I want you to notice is number one, is Joseph, the, story, the narrative begins with Joseph being loved and favored by his father. Favor is this, a gift bestowed as a token of love and approval and preferential treatment. How come you don't have to live as a victim? Because you have favor of God. It gives you preferential status in everything that you touch. Whatsoever your hands will touch, what? They will prosper. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of my, your life. If you diligently and hearken, uh, hearken to the voice of God, what does it say? It doesn't say maybe. It says you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Everything you touch is supposed to be blessed. I ask myself over and over again, how much of the Bible do I really believe is true? It sounds simple, but it's like I read it and I go, ooh. So Joseph is loved and favored, and notice that his love and favor is not caused by anything that he did except that he was born a son of his father. Amen. Amen. Here's the next thing you pull out from this narrative that's really, really interesting. And this is where... The mat hits the gym because I'm an ex-wrestler. <laughs> Simply because Joseph had favor and preferential treatment from his father, it doesn't mean the environment around him liked it. There was a clashing of two environments because of the favor of God upon his life. 
And what's happening here is God is calling Joseph as a young man to be a representative for a saving of a nation. Joseph was, God, was a representative of God's system. The environment around him represented the Babylonian system. And here's the other thing. You notice there that Joseph, it seems, we're not reading into the narrative to say there was some immaturity there. It seemed he took great delight in telling his brothers that they were going to serve him. Here's the other, this is, this, is, this is so much fun. It didn't stop God from calling Joseph even in his immaturity. Maybe he thought he was a little too amazing. It didn't intimidate God. Whatever issues you have, they don't intimidate God. Come on. That's good. Joseph's immaturity did not stop God from speaking and calling to him. Encounters and the voice of God are not... Uh, are, are not a, a fruit in your life that you're somehow mature. It's what you do with what you hear and receive. Amen. Unsaved people hear God all the time. It's what they did with what they heard and saw that brings transformation. That's why he, when he would speak, he would go, he who has ears, let him hear. They all had ears, but they weren't posturing their hearts correctly. And it, I love the parable of the sower because he goes through extensive time going, this is what happens when the word's sown. This is what happens when the word's sown. This is what happens when the word's sown. But there was, not, there was not anything deficiency in what God was saying. The deficiency was on what they received and how they acted from that moment forward and how they chose to define themselves according to that word. Why am I saying that? Because the measure by which you value what God is speaking will often be the measure by which you receive and produce what's being said. That's why I haven't arrived and I'm not perfect. But when I'm in a corporate meeting and the worship leader says, put your hands up, I put my hands up because I don't know them, but God has ordained them to be the voice of God to me in that moment. And I might not feel anything, I might not sense anything, but, but I listen because I cannot let a minute go past missing what anything that God is doing. And sometimes I have to have a physical act with it. Why, 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 you know, like the truth, the truth is this about giving. Why do I get so excited about giving? It's very true. God does not need your money. But giving is an act of worship, and he does love your worship. And when you worship God with your giving, you become like God who never lacks. The third thing is God speaks to Joseph in a dream. God speaks to Joseph in a dream. It wasn't just an audible voice. Why? Because every time God speaks, that's why it's sometimes my mysterious. We must restore the mystical nature of who God is. I get very nervous around people who just, oh, I just, I understand that. I got that. You've been saying the same thing the last four, four years, Pastor Dave. You got any other messages? Maybe you need to hear it because you've never done it or you've never allowed that truth to completely apprehend you as God intends. Come on, come on. Amen, amen, amen. I don't know why I'm saying some things, but you know, anyway. <laughs> but he speaks in these interesting ways because it's not necessarily about what he's speaking. There's a truth there. There's a reality there. But every time he speaks, it's an invitation for deeper relationship. It's a bridge into another aspect of the nature of God. It's a bridge into becoming and making that word a reality in your life. He ex we should expect God to speak. He speaks through, the, obviously, the, the, the written word of Scripture, the, the, the logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh. That's the logos. And then also the rhema. means an utterance. Example of that is uh, Luke 5. Simon said, We've, you know, the story, 
Jesus comes to Simon. He goes, hey, we've worked all night. We've worked all night. But nevertheless, at your rhema word, at the spoken word. Well, let's stop there for a minute. Because this is a brilliant, this story is a brilliant example of Peter switching systems. And it's also a picture of what we're supposed to be to the world around us. Peter is a fisherman who has not caught any fish. So Jesus gives him a lightweight word of knowledge. What does he tell him? It's, a, it's such a fascinating story to me. Like I read it over, I said, this is good stuff. Jesus comes to him and he says to him, he goes, throw your, what? <laughs> throw your nets to the other side. I've always identified with Peter in this story because he only throws his net about sinks his boat. Should have thrown his nets. Listen, when God speaks, he is often really, 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 really specific. Do what he says and don't argue with it. I've learned that one. I don't even have to like it. He's told me a few times. <laughs> Just got to do it. This, this is uncomfortable. He goes, that's okay. What? Throw your nets to the other side. Now, watch what's happening in this story. This is beautiful. This is Peter, who's a fisherman. What does he say? Master, I've spent all night, what? Toiling. I've been trying to get my own provision. I've been working really, really hard to get what I needed. And I've been, to I've been working all night in this same place where you're telling me to throw my nets. What changed? He had a word from God. One word from God elevates your status. He throws the net over. What happens? His boat almost sinks, and he's got more fish than he can handle. It's a picture not only of switching systems, but what it's supposed to look like when we walk with God. That not only we are supposed to have enough for ourselves, we're supposed to have enough to give it to everyone around us. In the dream where God speaks to Joseph, he gives him a picture of his future. The word of God came to him in the form of a dream, and it was a doorway into his future. The dream, keep this in mind, this is often why it's rejected by people. The dream was a seed that needed to be received by faith to enter into his future. What defines where you go tomorrow? It's a decision you make today. Today is the day of salvation. What, where you are right now is the sum, cumulative total, not what the devil did to you. It's of the choices that you made in life. But thank God for the grace of God. If you missed a turn somewhere, forgiveness right back on that track. No shame, no blame. I'll help you through everything. I just forgot to say this is very important. We should live with an expectation that God is going to speak with us. Often the question is not, is God speaking, but how is he speaking to me in this season? So he speaks to him, and that seed needed to be received, but it came in the form of a seed. But that, that dream had to define Joseph from that moment forward. Everything that God does is, does is relational. His dream, his prophetic vision, and therefore, his, and, and therefore the promise he was given became a part of his identity. Our future is defined by our current prophetic identity being agreed with. We're not waiting for our future to come to us. We're receiving by faith what God is saying in this season, beginning to shift our minds and our hearts to receive where he wants to go, and we're pressing on towards the mark of the high calling. We're actually stepping into our future. And one of the, one of the fruits that you know that you've actually received certain things is by what comes out of your mouth. And you really know you believe something, it's when something 
different than what God has told you. Not that, not that maybe, sort of, kind of, I ate cheese, I don't know. But when you know that you know that God has told you something, when you see something opposite, the first thing you say, this is what God has said, and I will not be moved. Joseph, I believe this, and we'll look at this probably tomorrow morning, became fully persuaded when he received the dream. Joseph had a prophetic hope that was not anchored in his present reality. This dream that Joseph got, and this is what we're called to be. Real prophetic people don't see the world as it is, but as that God intends it to be. This is how God desires to see America. He desires to see cities ablaze with the glory of God. He desires to displace lukewarm Christianity, think and feel, life coach Christianity, Christianity light. He wants to disturb all that. He wants to disturb the system for the kingdom of God to be established. He wants the people of God to walk in victory. He doesn't want them to be be slaves to leaders inside the church. He wants them empowered to walk in victory in every way. And he wants he wants us to be completely different but totally with the ability to affect the world around us. You can't change the world around you if you still like the things of this world. If you think it has some sort of attraction to you. It doesn't make you ineffective. It makes you the most relevant person on the planet. Joseph's dream was an invitation to the heart and character of God, and Joseph's dream carried with it a certain mindset. Did this fall off now? We're good. From the moment Joseph received the dream, he was a man with a promise and a vision. I believe Joseph was fully persuaded with the outcome. I don't know if I told this story last year, but I'll tell it again because I think it's important to articulate this point. Number uh, about about two years ago, I was in South Africa. Beautiful. Get a chance to go. Go to South Africa. Lord Jesus, it's nice. Where's my water? Oh, there it is. I'm running one morning. Running. And I'm thinking American traffic, and they drive on the wrong side of the road there. So I'm going to turn across the road, thinking I'll see any traffic that comes. And here comes a big dump truck, huge. It's like bigger than my whole house, big, big, one of these things. You have to get in a ladder. He's on the other side of the road, and I'm running like this, and it's like slow motion. And I'm thinking to myself, this is how people die. (laughs) And I did something very, very spiritual. I screamed like a girl. I went, ah! I didn't, you know, like, you, you call out Jesus, no. I don't know why. And I'm going, am I dead? And it just grazed my elbow. I don't know. I think there was an angel. I don't know. Here's the good news. We'll look at it later, probably tomorrow. A good day for Joseph is that he didn't die. The original plan was kill him. Here's the good news. When God's hands on your life... The enemy can't kill you. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Thank you. It was a little bumpy. It was a little bumpy coming into Baltimore today. And I looked at the lady. I said, I'm not dying today. I got promises from the Lord. Like, I always take comfort in that part of the story. Because, like, I've thought about it. I've had people come to, I'm going to die. I said, no, you just feel like you're going to die. You're not going to die. God's hand's on your life. You're not dying today, you know. And so the guy looks at me. I look at him. I'm going, I'm not in heaven. Well, that make you think about dying. So I went back to my hotel room that day. The Holy Spirit started speaking to me. He goes, you know, if you would have died today, you would have been with me. I said, yes, 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 I would have been. He said, why do you believe that? I said, well, and it brought me back to when I was a five-year-old, four, I think four, five or four, I think four, maybe three, I don't know. I get younger and younger every year. (laughs) Amen today. And I remember the church I grew up in, church my parents brought me to. The pastor's wife in this Sunday school class explaining to me that we all needed Jesus, that we were all in need of a Savior, 
and that the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross was sufficient and that he gave us eternal life and that if we received that, we would be with him forever. And I said, that sounds good to me. And I received Jesus as a child. But I didn't just hear that truth that day. I heard it over and over. I mean, we were classic Pentecostal. Like tomorrow night we have service. We had service. And you didn't stay home if you were sick. You got healed in service. At least they threw oil on you, you know. Lord Jesus. We had some interesting ways that we did things around then. And you didn't miss church ever. Not because it was just the thing to do, because it was actually the right thing to do. My parents showed us commitment to the things of God. You know, it's so funny. Like, like I know people today, like, they call the pastor. It's like Thursday and service is Sunday. They're like, we heard there might be a snowflake on Sunday, so we won't be there. <laughs> no one in this room, right? Yeah. <laughs> we had a really long week, so we won't be at church. Anyway, okay. Anyway. And he said to me, I heard that over and over again. To be absent from the body if you're in Christ is to be present. I heard it over and over again. Sometimes we didn't get a lot of things right, but we knew we were going to heaven. Seriously. We were flying away every Sunday. <laughs> and I heard it over and over and over again. Why? It was a truth that became established. And this is what he said to me. He said, I want you to believe Everything I tell you, just like you know you'll be with me one day. Did me like that too. Mm -hmm. We must be fully persuaded by defining ourselves by the word of God. Two things happen here. Joseph is 17 years old when he has this dream. Here's the funny thing about this dream. I'm telling you, God has a sense of humor. I can identify with Joseph. Nowhere in this dream does God show him any of the conflict. <laughs> it's awesome. Watch what's happening here. Two separate things are happening here. God is trying to establish him in his identity. But the enemy is going to try and establish him by everything that happens to him. <laughs> Other thing that's happening there is God is trying to teach him that he's trying to teach us, every one of us in this room. We are not to live reactors to every situation that happens to us. You're supposed to be an actor in the environment around you. Even, even as... Charismatics and Pentecostals, sometimes we have a tendency to, heat, to hit the weird religious button. And what do I mean by that? Anytime a crisis happens, we go, oh, Jesus, hurt, and start, you know. And all, I believe in confession, I believe in all that. You're defined by your words. But here's what I've learned to do. Even this week, we had a challenge come up. God, what are you praying about this situation? Amen. What's the word of the Lord? He'll either give me a scripture, he'll teach me something to say. Because you can spend a lot of time and a lot of energy just saying a bunch of stuff. But if you get what God is saying, you hit the mark every time. That is a prophetic lifestyle. And God, what is, what is my requirement right now in this season? How am I supposed to view this situation? I, I'm going to prophesy right now to some of you. Some of you are spending way too much time and energy doing things that God never ordained you to do in your situation, and you're worn out, and you don't know why. It's because God never called you to do certain things that you're doing. God never called you to be someone's God. God never called you to pay the price for your oldest children's mistakes that are out of the house that govern your life. Who is your God? the pink there. What's your name? What is it? Tabitha, Tabitha just lift your hands. The Lord is uh, freeing you 
from things of the past. Just lift both your hands. The Lord is freeing you from things of the past. And he says, you're, you're chosen, you're loved. Yeah. And Jesus is actually standing right in front of you. He's just, just stand right up. He's bringing adjustment to your heart tonight. And he's setting you free from f- wrong mindsets. The enemy, the last three days, the enemy has tried to torment you through wrong thoughts. He's like, it's just not worth it. It's not going to happen. It, and the Lord says, I'm breaking through on your behalf. And, you, and I just saw him put his hand on your shoulders. And he put his hand on your shoulders. And he just began to just release his peace, his kindness, and his goodness. And as a prophet of the Lord, I say that kindness and the goodness of God has visited you, and I say that you will never be the same, and even tonight, you're going to hear the voice of God as never before. I don't know, I just saw the fire of God go down your back, and I don't know if something's wrong with your back, but he's, he's releasing healing in your back. I'm going to land the plane here. God was trying to establish Joseph in his identity, and the enemy was trying to establish him in his identity. He loves intimidation, and he loves to talk. And it's so powerful because faith comes by hearing, but so does fear. So does unbelief, and so do these creepy crawler things called demons. They actually are given legal access when you give, when you, when you believe what they're saying. But here how, here's how powerful the word of God is. There's a fascinating thing that happens in the story of David and Goliath. David shows up on the scene bringing cheese and bread to those who are called to fight. It's very fascinating to me. What's fascinating there is that he's actually honoring a father who didn't believe in him. Big test in life to honor people who dishonor you. Why do we honor? Because we're people of honor. And because everyone's made in the image of God, they're valuable to God. Just stop for a moment. Every person in this room is valuable to God. I don't care what you feel. I don't care what you've done. The kind, the cross of Jesus, the blood of Jesus made you valuable and opened up the door so God would never be far from you. I don't care if you made your worst mistake last night. I don't care if you've made the same mistake over and over again. The kindness of God is extended towards you. He's that. He's beyond good. Like, he's just way beyond. Like, he's better than any father's heart book you've ever read. They cannot be described with good words. Accurately. Fully accurately. Let me just say that. But here's what's happening. The voice of the enemy through Goliath. And pick that up. It can come through other people. You're either being the face of God to somebody or the face of the devil. There's no demilitarized zone. Choose who you're going to serve. And catch what's happening here. All these guys who are trained for battle, they're all warriors, and they're all under the same covenant that David was under. Modern day charismatic vernacular. They'd all been to the VOP, the VOA. They've all heard the same things David heard. Randy prayed for him. Bill prayed for him. They were so excited when Georgian prayed for him. They even got a prophetic word from Graham Cook. But the voice was so powerful that they believed it and it locked them into fear. They heard the voice of Goliath and couldn't see God past it. See, the prophetic lifestyle gives you the ability to see from God's perspective despite the big man standing in front of you. Amen. Amen. And, and 
he describes, the, the, I believe, the, the, if you read the story of 1 Samuel 17, he spends five verses describing how big Goliath was. I believe it was key because you're not meant to look with your natural eyes. I've learned this. If you will look with your natural eyes, you will die. You got to see everything through the eyes of faith and how God sees it. And here, she keeps talking, talking. And, and David goes, what is the first thing he goes, what's going to be done for who kills Goliath? Number one, he's getting a prophetic look. He, he's, he's beginning to declare, and he's beginning to go, this is what's going to happen when I kill this guy. He begins to encourage himself with the prophecy he's gotten. And, and listen to, watch what's happening here, though. The guys who are trained for battle, who'd been to the same conference and ministry school at him, go, oh, well, you get no taxes, and that's really good, because Saul taxes more than Bernie Sanders wanted to tax. <laughs> and you get the king's daughter, and she's a good-looking girl. What are they, they had knowledge, but they didn't operate in revelation. It's very fascinating. They're actually telling David what he can do, and they can do the same thing. Yeah. And they're content to watch him do it. He said, well, maybe God sovereignly called him. That might be true, but they were called to battle, and they were on God's side. Yeah, yeah. He asked twice, and then we know actually goes out and do it, does it. But here's the encouraging thing. Those who didn't go to battle won a victory when David won a victory. Prophetic people win victories for other people. Amen. I'm almost landing the plane. You guys have been awesome. Thanks for listening. Now, faith is the assurance and the title deed of the things we hope for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of the reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. senses. There's, there's not anything in Joseph's natural environment that says he's going to be a ruler over his brothers, except he's got a word from God. What makes you qualify for what God's called you to do? You got a word from God. But for by faith, the men of old gained divine approval. Why is that so important? It says, for by faith, the men of old gained divine approval. What did Joseph have to put his faith in? He had to put his faith in the dream that God gave him. If you don't know the dream that God gave you, you can't put your faith in it to see it come to pass. You're like, well, I'm not quite sure what God's called me to do. Well, I can help you tonight. I don't think the will of God is that difficult for anyone in this room. There's a biblical standard that I believe God calls everyone to do. It's this. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Number two, pursue a kingdom lifestyle. Everything in the Bible. Prophesy, lay hands on the sick, cast out demons. Pursue that. And then there's a third, I think, biblical helper for everyone in this room, and it's this. Become part of a community. You are not saved unto yourself. You are saved unto the, uh, to the community of the universal church. There is no salvation outside the church that God is building. And I have, ne wh whatever form it takes, it could take a form like it's expressed through Roy and Darlene's house. It could take a form, but it must be under someone who God has called. Amen. Could be under a tree. I don't care where you meet, but find out where you belong and then get involved. Listen, my name is Suarez. I grew up in my parents' house, and I had certain responsibilities by being part of my family's house. I never told my mom when she asked me to do something, that's not my gifting or that's not what God called me to do. 
I never told her I'm going to pray about it. If I told my mom I was going to pray about it, I have a Pentecostal sandal flying right across me. I prayed about it. Go do it. <laughs> what do I say that? Find something you can put your hand to. I'm not saying it's your end goal. Years ago, I knew the Lord had called me to this certain uh, body. I'm still part of Came back to when I came back to North Carolina. And they stood up one day. I'm in the back of the room. I'm going, God, make me a revivalist. I know you're called me to the nation. I knew God had called me. The moment I surrendered to something nearly 20 years ago, I knew I'd go around the world. I didn't feel. I didn't sense. I didn't know. But as soon as I stood up in a moment of surrender, I knew what my life would look like. Not completely, but I knew. I've never doubted it since that moment. You know, it's like being a man. I've never doubted being a man. I'm a man. I'm not trying to be a man. I'm not trying to be called. I don't know why I said that, but uh, maybe this is another thing. You, you don't need to try and do things. You need to do certain things. But I remember... I remember I knew I was joining the right place when the first time I went to visit this church, they had two services on Sunday morning, and the 8.30 service didn't let out till 11.45. And people were still on the floor from the first service. And I said, you know, sometimes you don't need to pray about stuff if you're looking for a move of God. I said, I don't need to pray about anything. This is the place to be. And that day... My pastor, man of God, father of my life, he spoke for two hours and 20 minutes on the fear of the Lord and holiness. And then he said, if you want to receive that, come up and receive prayer. And he prayed for 600, 700 people that day. I said, I think I'm in the right place. And I knew that's where God had called me. I said, God, you called me here. I won't leave till you tell me to leave. And I remember one day they asked, I haven't arrived, but I just remember one day, I, I, because I knew God had called me to be part of that community. I knew that I knew. They said, we need help with the children. I don't, I'm not necessarily called to children. I love children. But you know what? The community I was a part of needed somebody to a laborer for children. Amen. Here's the beautiful thing today. Here's the beautiful thing today. Many, uh, I'm getting a little older, but I'm getting younger. Many of those same kids are now 20 and 22, 23 years old. They're still on fire today. Why do I say all that? I don't know. I've gotten on a few rabbit trails tonight. Because I've never met anyone who does those things that go, yeah, I just don't know what God wants me to do. If you put in certain biblical parameters, the will of God will be very well known. And here's another thing. I'm just going to let it. I, I felt that, you know, when I came tonight, I felt like that kung fu thing come on me tonight. Like, ooh, tonight's going to, I'm going to shaka, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just felt it, you know. I felt it was going to be one of those nights. <laughs> I don't know why, but I felt like, you know, like you feel like, I just knew it was going to be one of those. No man and no woman can stop the call of God upon your life. I don't care if they tell you you can't prophesy. I don't know. They don't receive my gift. It doesn't matter. They can't stop it. If God has called you, no one can stop you. They can kick you out. Some of you need to get kicked out some of the places you're at. Because you're just staying there. Like, what, like, what are you going to say to, to Jesus? Well, my parents go here. That's why I'm still here. <laughs> well, I've been there since where I was a kid. That doesn't register in heaven. See, God is not against culture. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> but your culture cannot define what you'll do in the kingdom of God. Culture always comes under the banner of Jesus. And then you also have to ask, do I love my culture or ethnicity more than I love the kingdom of God? And we got to break all these stereotypes.
There's nothing wrong with certain cultural expressions. But like some people here, like you're Hispanic, you're in ministry, and they think of a certain character. Are you Benny Hinn? No. Or if you're black, you got to be, ha, ha. All that's, all that's, cult. there's nothing wrong with cultural expressions, but we cannot define people by stereotypes God never intended. No one can stop you from God's call on your life. They may, they may push you down for a minute. They may try, they, you may look like you're down four pegs, but I'm telling you, if you, you no one, <laughs> no. slavery and Potiphar did not stop Joseph from changing a nation. Amen. Anyway. I'm going to land the plane here. Thank you, guys. Prophetic people learn to see the future from God's perspective and manifest it in the seen realm. What's happening? God's intent, God is very intentional towards you. We, we will land with this, but here, read this. This is really important. Turn with me for Psalm 139. There's such a grace in this room. I don't know if you feel it. I know we've gone a while, but I want to read this all. Oh, Lord, you search me and you know me. You know my sitting down and rising up. You understand my thought afar, afar off. Selah. God has knowledge of every person in this room. He knows the pain you've gone through. He knows the difficulty you've gone through. And he's looking and goes, I can help you with that. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. For there's not word on my tongue. But behold, O oh God, you know it all together. You've hedged me behind and before. Beautiful. And you laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me. I agree. It is high and I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if you're like me. This is exciting stuff. Yes, is, right? Sometimes you got to encourage yourself. Put your feelings into place. Well, I don't, you know, I, 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 today, this was one of those weeks, so now I'm, you know. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall upon me, even at night it shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as a day, and darkness and, and light are both alike to you. Here's where I want to get to. For you formed my inward parts, and you covered me in my mother's womb. why we're pro-life I don't care if both your parents didn't even know each other the day you were conceived and you never met your mother and father God is so good he makes beauty out of that I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and your days they were all written. The days fashioned before me when as yet there were none of them. Here it is. How precious are also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. He said his thoughts towards you are as the precious of the sand. Lord Jesus. That's a lot of thoughts. And here's how it looks from God's beautiful perspective. December 9th, 1977 is going to be a good day. It's going to be the day I'm going to put Abner into the earth. And I got some ideas, and I'm, I'm going to walk with him for eternity. 
and I'm going to show him some things. And there's a purpose that I have for him in the earth. And I'm going to reveal to him things that are going to blow his mind in the earth. And part of what I'm going to reveal to him, it has to be fulfilled in the earth during a certain period of time. So here's what happens. And this is why abortion is such a dreadful thing. There are thoughts in the heart of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thoughts so big as the sand. And, and Jesus is sitting on the throne in heaven. And he, and he, and he goes, oh, they'll be born then. And when they're supposed to be born, there's, a, there's, there's a, a concept, there's an idea, there's a purpose, there's a beauty that God has for that person. And it's released from heaven. And when it comes from heaven, it needs to go towards earth because man and woman become a transfer point between heaven and earth. They come from the unseen realm. We read it tonight in Matthew 18. You actually have authority in two dimensions, in heaven and on earth. And your life becomes a transfer point between heaven and earth to fulfill the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. What was Joseph's life? His life was a bridge. His life was a gift to the world for the saving of God's chosen beautiful people. And let me just prophesy this. They're coming in in the millions, God's chosen people. There's a visitation coming to that land like we've never seen before. He has not forgotten about the apple of his eye. Our lives become the transfer place between heaven and earth to birth God's desire in the earth. Lift your hands if you receive this word. And in Jesus' name, I say that God is making all grace abound towards you to fulfill every good work that God has called you to. I say your hands, your eyes, your ears are places and canvases for the will and the purpose of God. I say that even tonight, the Lord says, this church is crossing over into a new place. It's crossing the Jordan with the right mindset and the right mentality to enter into a land of fruitfulness and a land that it has never gone before. Lord. <laughs> the Lord says, the Lord says, I saw you. This is a picture I saw. You were like a little cat and you've been growing up into all things. But the Lord says, you've yet to run. <laughs> Like the lion of the tribe of Judah that I've called you to roar. For the day you were birthed, the day you were birthed, says the Lord, the day you were birthed was a day here on earth, but I birthed this since the, before the foundation of the earth. I birthed this place with the capacity to dream way beyond that which was possible. I birthed the womb of this house to be a storehouse, a Joseph storehouse, for millions of dollars to flow through, for transformation to take place to this region. The Lord says you've been transforming individuals, but the Lord says there is now a mandate to transform a region. And I will build the house of prayer here, says the Lord. Day and night, worship and prayer unto me. Day and night, the glory of the Lord. Day and night, the lamp will not grow out. For indeed, there should be a prophetic sign to this region. A prophetic sign of a people who will worship me 24 hours a day, 7 days a week of the purposes of God. And there have been some who their foot is in, but it's also out. I say to you, today is a day of reckoning. Today is a day of decision. 
For even your divine destiny is tied to the purpose and the will of God upon this house. Some of you are supposed to be teachers. Some of you are supposed to be working with the children. Some of you are supposed to be even working with the infants. Some of you are supposed to be working even with the unwed mothers. And I say to you, lift up your plow and go to work in this field of harvest. For it is not a time of inactivity. It is not a time to slow down in the purposes of God. But the Lord says, I am releasing a wind, says the Lord. A wind, a divine wind tonight where I will accelerate all things in the purposes of God in this house. And there is a divine hammer even being released tonight. A divine hammer to bring order, structure, and purpose. And the Lord says, I have had great grace, great, great grace, great, great grace, and my hand of grace and my hand of mercy is always extended. But the Lord says, I will not wink at some of the activities some of you are involved in anymore. I am calling you to come up higher. I am calling you to come up into the secret place and not and not visit my hand through the voice of others. I'm calling you to, to come into the place of maturity, popers, and divine alignment. For I have spoken, and I have spoken gently, but I desire to fiercely roar in this place as never before. I desire the fear of the Lord. And a fear of my name to come to this house as never before. For this is a sobering moment. And this is a place of divine intersection for the purposes of God. For this house. And this time. But the Lord says, there is corresponding grace for everything I ask you to do. There is my great compassion and there is my great love for everything I've spoken. If you'll align properly, I'll give you grace to overcome. I'll give you the grace no matter where you've fallen to lift you up. I'll give you the grace to go every place I've called you to go. I'm not angry or mad at any person in this room, but I desire greater fruit and fruit that will remain so that eternal purpose would be fulfilled in this house. I see this beautiful stream just flowing here up front. And here's what I want you to do. I believe the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Just as a sign of agreement. Don't, don't come yet, but I'm going to count to three. But there was something the Lord said there toward the end. He said there's a corresponding grace to do, to align how I'm asking to align. And I just feel if by faith you'll receive this word, that as you come, there'll be a grace. Just sit, encourage you to lay. If you can't, that might be difficult, no, no problem. But, but as you come here, there's going to be a cleansing. Some of you are going to be, condemnation is going to be broken off of you. Some of your, your minds are going to be healed. Some of you, your bodies are going to be healed. But there's like a physical thing that many of you will feel tonight that as you lay in the presence of God, 
there'll be this divine alignment with what God's doing here in this room. If you want to come up and just play too. But why don't you stand across this room? I want you to put your faith, obviously not in me, but in a God who's doing something in this room. Let's do it together. I'm just going to count to three and just, just step into that river tonight. Step into that river. One, two, three. Just go. Just find a place. This is just personal between you and the Lord. Just receive the cleansing of the Lord. Someone tonight, I believe, the Lord is um, bringing a healing from sexual abuse. He's beginning to heal your heart tonight. There's a river of healing that the Lord is giving you. He's, I just see Jesus, he's right in front of your heart. And he's bringing adjustment to your heart. And he's beginning this healing happened believe when you were a child and there's a healing so just receive whew, healing tonight so when you're being healed in your neck someone's right ear the Lord is healing I'm telling you just some of you are sensing, feeling things. Just interact with that which you're, healing, you're feeling because there's this, this interaction with the unseen realm tonight.
make sure the Missions America team is just up here and just receiving.
And only one word comes to mind. There is only one word to describe. And only one word comes to mind. So I see the Lord is healing people from rejection, the mighty hand of God, from childhood to adulthood. Rejection is going now. The love of God is coming down, and he's just crying out, open up, open up, I'm here. Receive my love, a love like you've never known, a love that's just so kind to you.
life. You give us everything and there is nothing for I'm just so grateful. So grateful. Lord Father God for the redemption, the salvation, for the blood that I'm covered in every day, every day, Lord, in every situation. Who can be against me if you're with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord. I've just seen the Father looking over you, and he's so pleased tonight. He's released angels and camp round about them that fear him to deliver you. Whatever you're going through, those enemies that you saw, you'll see no more. They'll be swallowed up. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for people, God, Engaging, Lord. I just saw you I lifted my head and I looked throughout the room, face down, worshipers. God, we just give it to you, Lord. We give you this weekend. And most of all, we thank you, Lord, for all that you entail and all that you desire for this weekend. I thank you, God, stirring up the gifts activating. God, I thank you right now for dreams that are coming tonight. In the night season right now, we declare prophetic dreams to be released. That he's going to awaken the dreamers in this room. He's going to awaken prophetic dreams and he's going to begin to stir you up. God, I thank you for the angels here. And I thank you, Lord, for healing virtue that's flowed. Even minds being settled in that peace. Minds that have been tormented, minds that have been ravaged by the enemy. We thank you, Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there's peace that passes all understanding. Peace to rest completely and thoroughly. Thoroughly. He gives his saints peace. You will sleep and you will know the Lord spoken to you. God, I just thank you, Jesus. Whoa. I thank you, Lord. And Lord, we just ask tomorrow, Lord, just continue, continue.